I've got way more to preach this morning than I knew I had time for. And uh, so I already know that I'm going to sort of cut things in half. And I want to give a little time toward the end of the service uh, to have um, a prayer time. And it'll just be a, uh, it'll be our way of praying, praying out the old year, praying in the new year. And uh, I know that I need it. And uh, it was actually recommended to me by somebody. uh, And what they recommended was a little bit different than what I'm going to do this morning, but it's the same idea. So I just want to give the Lord time this morning. And uh, I want to give our prayer time some time. Turn to Second Samuel chapter 7, if you would. Second Samuel chapter 7. And um, we'll read verse 12. Uh, verse 12, 13, and uh, 14, 15, so on. Appreciate everybody here. Uh, it's good to have uh, Elizabeth, right? I can't believe I remembered your name. I never remember names the first time around. Uh, she has, she said she's been trying to watch all my videos online and I'm going, good luck. Cause I purposely put a lot of them out there. Cause I want the devil to be irritated with what I say. I want him to hate my guts, and I'm here to tell you this morning he does, and I feel it today. Second Samuel chapter 7. This is, uh, again, I, I've titled the messages, the series of messages, How God is Raising Me. And um, he's not done raising me. He still has work to do. And... Um, I'm glad that God is not done with me. I want to say that up front. I'm glad that I'm going through what I'm going through this morning. I'm glad that I am struggling the way I'm struggling this morning. Because if I wasn't and I didn't ever struggle against the devil, that would mean that I already belong to him and he doesn't have to work against me anymore. So I'm glad that I don't belong to him this morning. Can I hear God's people say amen if that's true about you? Second Samuel chapter 7 verse 12. This is what God said to David concerning David's son. David had several of them. And some of those sons are in hell right now. David's salvation did not guarantee his son's salvation. We know that one of David's sons raped his own sister. And that son was murdered because of it. And then the son that murdered the son that raped David's daughter, that son tried to steal David's throne and was subsequently murdered for that. In fact, we know that he's in hell because he died hanging on a tree. And the Bible says, cursed is he that hangeth from a tree. So don't ever... Think that because your mom and dad are saved or your dad was saved or your mom is saved that you're automatically saved. Don't ever think that. But God made a promise to David concerning one son. And we know that son to be Solomon. In spite of all that Solomon did, all the things that he did wrong, we know that Solomon's in heaven. We know that because, number one, what God said here... That he promised he'd never take his mercy away from him. And two, we know that Solomon, God allowed Solomon to write part of the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. And P. 
Peter said, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we know Solomon being a part writer of the Bible, we know he's in heaven. So God said this to David concerning that same son Solomon. He said, and when thy days be fulfilled, verse 12, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I want you to look at verse 14 and 15. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity... I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. Now, you know, I've said this many times. I'm going to say it again. Why? What was the difference between Solomon and Saul? I mean, we have all these sins listed that Solomon did. All these wives that he kept, all the wine that he drank, all the pagan temples, all the high places that he built, he burned incense to false gods. And we have all these, this whole list of several thousand sins that Solomon committed, and yet we only have one sin that Saul committed. Just one. Why did God... Take his mercy away from Saul and not Solomon. When surely, if we were if we were to judge the way the world judges, world judges and says, my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, therefore I'll get to go to heaven. And yet when we look at Saul and Solomon, it doesn't look that way. Solomon had all these thousands of sins on one side, and Saul only had one. But Saul's sin was, he called God a liar. He called God a liar. He denied what God told him to do. And when Samuel confronted him with it and said, you didn't do what God said. He said, I did too do what God said. He called God a liar. And I'm here to tell you today, you cannot call God a liar and go to heaven. Can't do it. So at that exact moment, we know for a fact that God took his mercy away from Saul. Because if you go read that, after Saul did that, he then tried to repent. And, and Samuel told him, forget it. Forget it. It's too late. There's no mercy on you. So out of all the things that all of us can be guilty of. Don't call God a liar. Amen? And what that means is, don't say this is wrong. Don't say that's wrong. That's calling God a liar. But what was it about Solomon? You know, Solomon was the king that every nation in the world paid tribute to Solomon. Every nation in the world. There, Solomon never fought a war his whole lifetime. David fought all the wars and everybody was afraid of the nation of Israel because of David. So by the time Solomon comes around, Solomon has no enemies. Every nation around. We even have evidence that people from Central South America made a trip over and paid tribute to King Solomon. They heard of King Solomon. So how is it that Solomon got punished or got chastened by men. There's a way, and I'm not prepared to preach that, but there were men who rebelled against Solomon during his lifetime that hated Solomon's guts, and they were not afraid of him. And God used those men to bring chastening to Solomon's life. But God made a promise that he would always forgive Solomon's sins but, if he transgressed God's law, he would get punished for it. Now, up on the screen, 
Did you figure it out? Everything up there has been and probably still could be used to punish a child with. I got a belt. Let me circle mine here. I got this one. And I got this one. My mom tore a switch off a tree. Little thin little stick off a tree. And put stripes on the back of my legs like you wouldn't believe. You know why? I cursed. I said dirty words. And I said it in front of my mom. She heard it. And she grabbed the switch and she went after me like nobody's business. My mom says that when she was little, some of you can remember days like this, they had to go out and cut their own switch. You had to cut your own switch, didn't you? And if you came in with one that didn't quite cut the mustard, you had to go out, they had to go out and cut it and you got it twice as bad. Am I right? Some people tell of being whipped with a razor strap. Michael came from Kenya and he always talked about how he went skinny dipping. You know what that is? He went swimming naked. When he's a boy. And he come home, his mama caned him. I mean, she took a cane and, and gave him a whipping. My wife raised our children with one of these in church. So if you come visit our church and you see a wooden spoon in the pews, it's not to stir chili with. It's to raise children with. My wife raised our children to be able to sit through two, sometimes three hours worth of church service and not scream and fuss and throw a fit the whole time to get their way so they wouldn't have to sit in church service. She did that. We started having children. I was pastoring the church down at Richwoods and my wife took a wooden spoon to that church down there when our babies were young. She taught them how to sit in church. She did that there. And she did that here. Let me ask you a question. Is that child abuse? No. It's not child abuse. See God, this is how God is raising me right now. I mean, I'm having a pretty rough time today. Been having one for several days now. And there's two reasons why any Christian will go through hard times. It, A, it could be that they haven't done anything wrong and the devil's just persecuting you. And Peter said, if you read the book of 1 Peter, five chapters in 1 Peter, and every, in, every chapter in there, it, in there is about, it's better to be chastened and persecuted for righteousness sake than it is for what you did wrong. So, if you feel like the devil's coming after you, or you feel like you've been beat up, or you feel like... You've been mistreated or you're just having a bad day or whatever. Maybe, maybe it's because you're living right. And the devil, God will allow the devil to persecute you in a small way. So that because of living right, your head don't get all arrogant and cocky with God and saying, look at me, I'm living right. Amen. Or. It could be that God is whipping you. And if you're a son of God, I talked this morning in Sunday school about being a son of God. And God just said to David concerning Solomon, I don't care if he is king. 
If he transgresses, I will chasten him with the rod and with the stripes of men. I, you hear what God said? God said, I'll put marks on him. They say, it's okay to whip a child, just don't leave any marks. God said, I'll put marks on him. But God said, I'll never take my mercy away from him. But if he sins, I have a way of driving that iniquity out of him. And it's called chastening. Now, chastening is something that most parents have been talked out of by the psychology of this world. Schools don't do it anymore. Who got a whipping in school? Raise your hand. Who has never gotten a whipping in school? Okay. At some point, they just, school said, we're not going to do it no more. So they started doing other things. And in today's world, I'm not so sure with the type of people that they have teaching our school children and the type of people they have running our schools, I'm not so sure that I want some Body else whipping my children at school. I'm not sure that I trust teachers anymore or school principals anymore in this world. You see what I'm saying? But just because the world and the psychiatrist and all the doctors say that this is wrong, just because the social workers say it's wrong, just because the liberals say it's wrong, that doesn't make it wrong. With God, it's still right. And if you don't believe that, either learn it or don't expect God to be your father. Because God says, if I'm your father, I'm going to whip you. If you want me to be your father, if you want me to be your God, you want to come live in my house. If it's God's house, it's God's rules, right? Right? And God says, you want to live in my house? Fine. You get to be my son. You want to be my son? That's fine. But you live in my house and you live under my rules. And if you don't live under my rules, then I'll chasten you. And if I can't chasten you, then you cannot live in my house. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Turn in your Bible. Turn to Deuteronomy. You need to turn there anyway. My good friend, Brother Reg Kelly, preached this. He preached a message on whipping your children. At the end of the service, preachers out there shaking everybody's hand as they leave, and a woman stormed out saying, I don't believe in that. He said, well, ma'am, that's what the Bible says. I don't care what the Bible says. That ain't right. I don't guess she came back. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 5. I want you to hear how God sees. And remember, this is on multiple levels. In fact, let me ask you this. Where you work, is there not some sort of program in place whereby if you do something wrong at work, is there not some form of punishment? Either three days without pay, two weeks without pay, or you get one, you get this put down on your record. If you get three strikes in your record, you get fired. Where you work, is there not some form of punishment? Then why can't it be also, number one, in the home? Number two, in Christian life. Number three, even in the church. Even in the church. There's church discipline. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 5. God said, thou shalt also consider in thine heart. You know what that means? Think about this for a while. Meditate on it. That as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore, Thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. 
Do you see that phrase, fear him? Turn in your Bible to uh, Isaiah chapter 11. Turn there. Isaiah chapter 11. I want you to look at your Bible. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. What did he say come forth out of Jesse? A rod. You know who that rod was? Christ. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. That's what a switch is. It's a branch. But look at verse 2. Here are the seven spirits of God. Here is, if you say that you're saved, if you say that you're a Christian, then you will have... The seven spirits of God in you. And look at what they are. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's the first one. Number two, the spirit of wisdom. Number three, understanding. Number four, the spirit of counsel. Number five, the spirit of night, might. Number six, the spirit of knowledge. And number seven, the fear of the Lord. Why, how will you fear God if you don't believe that he will ever chasten you? You know, when I hear... You know, at Walmart or other places, when I hear children to their parents stomp their foot and say, No! You know, when I hear that, you know what I know? You know what I know never happens? That child never gets a whipping. Never. That child is not afraid of that parent. And that child will grow up never being afraid of any authority, ever. Now you tell me, a child that is not afraid of any authority ever, where will they end up? So God said back in Deuteronomy 8, Thou shalt also consider, pray, think about this, as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. So what is the purpose of God chastening us? Does God just chasten us because God's in a bad mood? He come home, he had a bad day at work, he got drunk, and he took it out on the kids. Is that why God chastens us? Why does God chasten us? Number one, so that we'll keep his commandments. Number two, so that we'll fear him. And the fear of the Lord is one of the spirits of God that you'll have in you. You see, there are things I did wrong growing up, and there are things that I knew never to do as a child in my home. Like run from my mama when she's chasing me down. I never... If my mom said, hand me your belt, lay across the bed, I didn't try to run out of the house and run away. I knew that would make it worse. I gave her my belt and I laid across the bed. You know why? Because I feared her. You know why I feared her? Because she had already whipped me before. And I knew that, I, see, I knew if my mom said to me at church, you're getting a whipping when you get home. You know what I knew? I knew that when I got home, I was getting a whipping. Because if my mom told me, you're getting a whipping. She may not have wanted to whip me in front of everybody in church. She may not have wanted to whip me in front of everybody at the grocery store. But if she told me, when you're getting home, you're getting a whipping. When I got home, I got a whipping. Do you know what? You know, threatening to whip a child is not the same as whipping a child. And God has never threatened you, but what He's done it. So that's how God's chastened me. That's how God's raising me. If God tells me, Mike, I'm going to get you for that. He got me. He got me. Now I turn to Deuteronomy 21. I want, I want all of our young people, I want all of our young people, I want you to read this in your Bible. 
Now, let me say this. There are people sitting in this room right now. And there are people listening online right now. Who were abused. By an adult. Physical. Abuse. By an adult. Growing up. Whoever did that to you, I hate them. You don't ever abuse a child. But if that is what's in your mind, let me reassure you, God has never treated any of His children that way. Ever. God has never treated, He's never treated me that way. My mom, my dad, they love me and my sis. I remember mom come out at us one time with a broom. She was not abusing us. She never abused us. She loved us. She knew that the same kind of sinful nature that was in her was in us. And she knew there's only one way to deal with that. Now, did I get a whipping for every little thing I did? Like if I left food on my plate, did I get a whipping? No. If I got a D on my report card, did I get a whipping? No. And let me tell you this. God doesn't whip me for every little thing I do. Because if he did, it'd be like a non-stop whipping. But, I want you to look at Deuteronomy 21, because I want you to understand that a person who will not let God chasten them. God has the most severe consequence for that that there is it's in the law Deuteronomy 21 verse 18 did we pray yet it's 12 I better pray father I don't know how much you this you want me to preach I don't know how you want me to preach it but I need your help Lord this is not the best day in the world for me and I probably shouldn't even be up here. So Lord, I pray God should give me grace. Humble me. Afflict me if you have to. Chasten me if you have to. God, if I say anything wrong out of line. I'm sorry. The Father, bless this church. Because God, how you raised me, if you love anybody else that way, Father, you'll raise them the same way. And I'm glad, Father, that you love me to not let me get away with what I want to get away with. So, Father, help us to hear the word of the Lord this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said... Here's the most, here, is, here is the most severe punishment that God has for someone who says, I'm a Christian, and yet they will not let God chasten them. If a man have a stubborn and a rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother. And that when they have chastened him, he will not hearken unto them. See, it's not that they just let their child get away with everything. They tried. And let me tell you. There are some people that grew up with parents that loved them enough to chasten them when they did something wrong that turned out bad Anyway, 
Mama tried, Mama tried, Mama tried to raise me better. Remember that song? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> See, that was written about a man who him, his mama raised him right and whipped him when he needed it. But he ended up in prison for the rest of his life anyway. There are some people who no matter what happens, they don't care, are never going to care. So if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out into the elders of his city and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. And let me say something to you. Young people and everybody listen to me. What would it take for a man to drag his own son out and hand him over to the elders and say, stone him. Let me tell you something. Parents can be pushed that far. Parents can be pushed that far. Children so rebellious, so evil, so vile, so wicked, they will not respond, they will not change. And mom and daddy has had it. And mom and daddy can be brought to that point. They shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So, thou shalt, so shalt thou put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. Now you say, Now that pastor, that's the Old Testament. We're not under that. Turn to Hebrews. Chapter 12. For every doctrine in the Old Testament, there's a double witness in the New Testament. For every doctrine in the New Testament, there's a double witness in the Old Testament. Out of the mouth of two witnesses shall every word be established, the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 12. Now I'm going to end, I'm going to end it here and then I'm going to share my heart with you. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5. You've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That we just, that we, that's what we just read. If, verse 7, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? In other words, if you as a child of God will respond to God's chastening you, God will guarantee you two things. Number one, he's removing that sin out of your life and he's doing it through chastening. That's the first thing God's doing. See, God's doing it for your benefit. Number two, God is securing your place in heaven because you are His Son. So, the chastening that God gives us, is it for God's benefit or is it for our benefit? It's for our benefit. But look at what He said. Verse 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. What that means is, if God, after He has chastened you, if He still can't change you, can't change your mind, if all you do is despise God while He's chastening you, even an earthly parent would give up their own children because they say, you're no son of mine. You, I could never do anything with you. 
I could never talk to you. I could never correct you. You're no son of mine. Even an earthly parent would do that. Am I right? So will God. So will God. And you know what? I believe that enough that I'm afraid of it. I know for a fact that had God not chastened me the way he had and I not responded to it the way he intended, God would put me out in a heartbeat. So what I'm saying to you today is, you may not like what's going on in your life. Nobody, nobody that's not having a party really does. And that's what he says in Hebrews 12, now, verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. I get that. And usually, usually, every time something bad happens, and, and it's because of something I did... Usually the Holy Ghost will say, uh, Mike, before you get all upset, and remember what you did? Yeah, I do. Then, knock it off, Mike. This is happening to you because you had it. In fact, it's better than what you had coming. What you have coming is hell, but that's not what I'm giving you. I'm giving you a whipping which is better than what you deserve. God, you're right. God, you're right. But then there's the one who they get affliction and they rebel against God. They act like it's everybody else's fault but their own. And God will say, you are no child of mine. Depart from me. I never knew you. That scares me. And as long as I have that fear in me, that's what keeps me on the good side of God and not the bad side of God. That's how God's raising. Well, you think I was born perfect? You think I was born good? Talk to my mom. Talk to my No, don't talk to my mom or my sister. Talk to my, no, don't talk to my wife either. Don't talk to my... In fact, don't talk to anybody about me. I'm just telling you. I've got a wicked, wild, depraved, hell-deserving nature built into this skin. And I have gotten some pretty tough beatings because of it. So hard and so bad from God that I said, God, I never, never want to do that again. Because I don't want the whipping that goes with it. And it's worked. Now, that's the message. I'm going to share my heart with you. I've been... When I found out that Michael was almost killed and it scared him too. That was... that, And I, and I, should, have, I should have expected it because I said... You know, I, I, I showed the church, the people that we fed, 1,600 families for a week. All those kids that we gave toys to, the children at the orphanage that we blessed. And I knew, I knew the devil would try to do something. But I sure didn't think he'd try to kill him. But the devil tried to kill Michael. There's no doubt in my mind about it. There are no, in case you're, there are no accidents with God.
And it was, it was just another thing that has happened to people in this church this year. This year, we've had rebellion in this church so severe that it drove out people that I thought would never leave this church. And they're gone. And that hurt me. There have been sins that have been committed by people in this church that should have never been done. And that hurt me. My wife, I could have lost my wife because of cancer. And I don't know that I would have ever recovered from that one. And then we almost lost Michael. That would have been, that would have been the end of all of our ministry in Kenya. Everything, everything about that is on him. And I think the devil knows that. And this year has been probably the hardest, if, if, if not the hardest, the second hardest year since I've been pastor here that I've ever experienced, ever. Somebody called me the other day, God bless you. And suggested that maybe the church just lay hands on our family and pray over us because of all the things that we've gone through. And I appreciate that. But it's not just been our family. And what I would like to do What I really need is I need a better year next year than what I've had this year. Because it makes me afraid. It makes me afraid that uh, I won't make it. I asked God when I first became pastor here... To never, ever, ever take this church away from me. And he's kept me here all these years. But my wife will tell you, she knows, she saw me. I came pretty close to just walking out. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that to you people. I don't want to do that to you people online. I don't want to do that. But there's only so much a man can take. If you need your pastor. I'm standing here to tell you this morning that I need my church. So, I would like to um, close with prayer. But I would like this time, instead of me praying for you, I'd like for you to come and pray for me.